Hey, WBSC and Whiskey Network fans, I'm Chad Cadden. Joining me tonight are co-owners Bill Burnell and our editor, editor-in-chief of the Whiskey Network magazine, the magazine, magazine, the lovely Mindy Schwartz. Uh, welcome to the third round table, third of the roundtable series events. Uh, with us tonight, we have Greg Schwartz, director of the film *The Water of Life*. Uh, we're live here on WBSE. We also have tonight Alphonse, producer of *The Water of Life*, and Raj Saberwal. I had to say that very slow so I didn't mess that one up. Uh, Raj is a certified whiskey ambassador and founding partner of Glass Revolution Imports. Tonight we feature the Waterford Distillery, uh, the foremost single malt made in Waterford, Ireland. Waterford is, by their own description, a barley forward, terrier driven natural whiskey. Um, we welcome all of WBSC to join in the discussion night. We will try to get to your questions. Uh, this event, throughout this event, uh, we'll get to them if time allows. Uh, but before we get into tonight's discussion, uh, I would like to first raise a glass and say welcome and cheers, everybody. So I'm going to turn it over to Greg, and he is going to uh, share a clip of, uh, from The Water of Life. Greg? Thanks, Chad. Yeah, uh, we, before we get started with the conversation, we thought we'd show a scene from the film that is uh, built around Waterford. And actually, Alphonse would be the one who's going to physically do the sharing. <laughs> <laughs> physically, virtually. Here we go. Here at Waterford, we've been running a series of tests on two sites, two different varieties of barley. We can identify- We're not seeing the video. I'm not seeing anything. Exactly where- All right, sorry about that. <laughs> Here at Waterford, we've been running a series of tests on two sites, two different varieties of barley we can identify and prove precisely exactly where our barley was grown, who by, how they grew it, what soil, when it was harvested, who harvested it, the inside leg measurement of the guy that harvested it, absolutely everything. All right, thank you, Greg, for that preview of your film, The Water of Life. Is there anything you'd like to say about what we just watched? Well, I, I think in a, a lot of ways, that yeah, really says a lot about the, the sort of creative mission that Waterford has been on in the short time it's been in existence. I mean, I think Raj can probably speak to that even better than I can, but I, I mean, it's definitely why we knew we wanted to feature it in the film, because it was just a, a completely new thought process that, that Mark certainly began germinating uh, at Brooklady and then kind of took to the stars when, when he opened up Waterford and, and is now in the process of doing the same in Grenada with a rum distillery. But. Okay. All right. Um, so now we'd like to welcome Raj Saberwal. Raj, would you get, please give our panel and viewers some background on Waterford Distillery, what they offer, and as you lead us through a sampling of their expressions, and we continue on our journey with the water of life. Thanks, Bill. And thanks, everyone, for uh, having me on today. Um, yeah, Waterford is, as Greg said and demonstrated in the uh, little clip of movie you saw, it's a, it's a very unique distillery. Um, and, you know, people will ask, well, why Ireland? And uh, Mark Rainier will tell you that basically he followed the barley. So Ireland uh, has the best barley that's grown anywhere in the world. And uh, Mark wanted to uh, continue the journey. He started at Brucolati, um, which you know came to an abrupt halt in 2012 and was sold. Uh, so having Waterford as a distillery has allowed him to continue that. And we'll get more into uh, the, how the different whiskeys stack up and what makes them unique and what makes what Waterford is doing unique. All right. 
But if you haven't already, I'd, you know, pour your, the Rothkopf, which is the first uh, whiskey we're going to try, right, which is the uh, Waterford uh, Rothkopf um, 1.1. You know, um, I don't know if, uh, if anyone said anything yet, but uh, one thing I'll throw out there too is that, you know, um, Mark, a lot of people I realize that might be watching this haven't seen our film yet, but one of the big central pieces of the experiment of Waterford Mark really wanted to do is explore the difference that each different farm would produce with their own barley. And rather than mixing all the barley together and make these, these are all part of this uh, single farm origin series whiskey. Three of the four whiskeys we're doing are all from different individual farms. There are, Raj can tell you the specifics, but they're in every way possible identical, except for the farm, like you know, the same barley variety, same year, all that stuff. But yeah, that's exactly it, Greg. And, and you know, when I say Rothkopf, Rothkopf is the name of the, the farm where the barley was grown. Um, so the barley came from that farm. It is harvested separately. It comes to the, what they call the cathedral, where it is stored separately and allowed to dry separately. Uh, then when it's dried, it's malted separately, uh, fermented, uh, mashed, fermented, distilled, and finally uh, aged separately. So everything is traceable from when the barley is grown, where it's grown, and to when it ends up in the barrels, the different barrels, and uh, how it uh, comes together in the bottles that uh, we're tasting today. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the terroir code a little later, um, but you know, you got to know about Rothkopf that there was, it's a US exclusive, so there was 13,000 bottles uh, produced of this. And when you look at it and it says 1.1, that means it's the first harvest and it is the first release from that harvest. Um, you know, and there's no age statement on it. Uh, the other thing that your audience will notice is uh, whiskey is spelt with no E. Um, so this is, uh, you know, nobody says in Ireland, you have to have an E in it. And there are a few distilleries that do not, um, but you have to bear in mind that foremost, everything Waterford's producing are single malts made exactly the way they would be made in Scotland. They just happen to be made in Ireland. Let's get to taste the best. Yeah, let's taste it. So you know, once you dig stuff into this, you'll find it that it, you know, it'll give you when it was harvested, when it was distilled, uh, how long it was matured for, so this was actually three years, 11 months and 26 days. So just short of uh, four years and um, had 141 hours of fermentation, which is quite long. It's almost uh, more than double of what they would do in Scotland. You know, the barley really comes forward. And when I tasted it, I got a little sweet fruity note on it, which was very unexpected. I get a lot of honey on the nose mm. and then, mm -hmm. then on the palate, that sweetness comes through for me as pear. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I can see pear. You're like almost like a pear and syrup too, you know, like a, you know, like the sort of canned pears and syrup, right. you get that sort of. Yes. Like my grandmother's pears is what I think of because that's what she used to feed me, you know. It's, it's, <laughs> so all the barley from this, this distillate came from one farm. The Rothkopf farm, correct. Rothkopf, okay. And it was, it was all, it all went through the process separately. Um, it was, you know, it's kept separately. So when it was distilled and it comes off the stills at around 140, 141 proof, and oh, wow. it's not, it's not watered down. The barrels are filled at that full strength that was coming off the stills at. Um, and for the Rothkopf, uh, about 31% of it went into first fill. Uh, ex bourbon casks, 19% into virgin American oak, which is really unusual that a distillery in Ireland or Scotland are using uh, virgin or new American oak, 25% uh, French oak, and a uh, 25% into what they call uh, vendu natural, in this case, sherry. So 25% was in sherry. So all of the, the, the run from the still was split into these 200 barrels and these different configurations and allowed to age separately. And then Ned, who's the master distiller, brings them all together and creates what you're tasting in your glass. 
interesting for a, a young a fairly young whiskey this has got a lot of body to it it does it has a lot lot of deep flavors for being so young at that i mean the the more i uh visit this let it sit on the tongue uh swish it around a little bit you're you're really just picking up so many subtle very it's like everything's super soft with it yeah but uh it's nothing it doesn't come off young and grassy like a lot of younger whiskeys does does um but it really comes off that it's matured properly um and the finish just lasts with flavor not not so much a burn and i believe all these are 100 proof if i'm not Correct. mistaken okay yep. uh so for being a 100 proofer it doesn't drink super hot for being young uh it's it's really real uh, this is my very first time trying it so mm. i kind of wanted to go in this super blind yeah i mean i like to talk about the fact uh, you mentioned the word uh mature maturity chat and i think maturity is a lot more prevalent than age you know age is only a number but it's how that distiller or distillery treated the the whiskey um the kind of barrels they used um you know, the cuts they took, the fermentation method, and certainly in Waterford's case, the raw material. I mean, the fact that this is all traceable barley, they know where it came from, they know what happened to it, and how it transformed into this uh, great whiskey you're, you're tasting. No, we have the expression over here, farm to table, uh, when it comes to food and, and certain restaurants, and this is really uh, taking that to another level with whiskey. I like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the thing that really, this is not, this is the second time I've had the Rathclough. The other ones I've had before multiple times, but the thing that really blows me away about, well, all of them really is the, you can tell how good the wood is because it's, it's high ABV. It's a young whiskey and it doesn't drink like either of those things. You know, it has this kind right. of freshness and this um, uh, really just uh, well-roundedness to it. And, and I, you're right, Chad, I never thought about it before, but the, the tail on this just goes on and on. It, it really does. It, I mean, it's subtle, but it's there and it, it changes. It, it, it's quite frankly, it's a very interesting whiskey. I, I was a little hesitant uh, reading about it being young and um, I, I was just, a little, I don't want to say skeptical, I guess, uh, but I'm really glad I kind of waited to surprise myself because I'm very pleasantly surprised. Well, I'm interested to what these three. The, yeah, when we taste the other two single farm origins, uh, you know, it's all about the barley. So we'll be able to compare and contrast the Rothcloth to the Dunmore and the Dunbell, uh, just to show how that same barley from a different farm uh, tastes different. Well, that was going to be one of the questions that I had, but you answered it already. How did you come up with the names? And obviously, it's the name of the farm. Correct. Well, what's interesting, Bill, is that a lot of farms in Ireland don't actually have names. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Rothcloth, the farmer is Richard uh, Rothtees, and it would just be known as uh, the Rothtees Farm. But for uh, Waterford to have some designation, they asked the farmers, you know, what do you want to call it? And a lot of these names are actually old ancient sites that were near the farm, or in this case, uh, an old fort. Um, which okay. was very close to where Rothcloth is uh, located. So that's where the name comes from. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. And, and it seems like uh, terroir is the, the buzzword of the day with most whiskeys. Well, I don't know if it's with both whiskeys, but it's certainly well, uh, something that's controversial and uh, is raising a lot of uh, debate and uh, questions about it. I mean, I think... Uh, uh, you know, terroir is a French word, which I don't think really has an exact definition that can, you know, when you chant, translate it to English. Um, but as Mark uh, Rainier likes to say, you know, anybody who gardens or farms knows that the soil has a huge impact uh, on the on what you're growing. And not only the soil, um, the, the sunlight, the angle of the land to the sun, 
you know, what else is growing nearby, uh, how, how long you farmed on there. So there's a variety of different factors that go into it. Um, you know, it's terroirs probably more talked about with wine and certainly Mark's background with, you know, spending his first 20 years in the wine trade um, and his family being in the wine business before he started into whiskey, uh, you know, he'll, he learned about terroir and the, and the renaissance of terroir in winemaking and uh, has, has translated that into to whiskey and showing, you know, trying to prove and certainly has that uh, there is terroir that exists. So terroir is all about how that, how this barley that's in this whiskey came to be. Interesting. So the whiskey that came to be, do we want to go to number two? Um, absolutely. We can go to number two, which is the Dunmore uh, single farm origin. So uh, this is another farm. This was grown by the farmers, John Tynan. And before we go into it, I just want to, I want to share my screen and show people um, the terroir code. So there is on the back of every bottle a specific code. So this one you can see is right here. It is uh, on uh, there. And if you, let me just do this. So if you go on the Waterford site and you go into the terroir page and I've entered the code here and I click on enter. Um, and there's John and uh, you see all of the, the information about it, when it was harvested, when it was distilled, um, how long it was matured for, so three years, 11 months, and 17 days, uh, number of bottles, and when it was bottled here is where Dunmore is located in reference to Waterford Distillery. Um, here is all of the history about Dunmore and uh, where the farm lies, you know, the his going back to 1756 <laughs> was, uh, there it was uh, early medieval wow. fort that lends the townland its name. Um, and if you are so inclined, you can even click on here and hear the sounds of Dunmore. So it's like you're, you're actually on the, on the farm and you're listening to everything about it. Um, so, so far they've had three different harvests that have gone into it, 2015, 2017, and 2018. Um, and this particular one, all the dates, when it arrived at the cathedral, the cathedral is where the barley is stored to dry. Uh, when it went to maltings, arrived at the distillery, the fermentation, so on Dunmore, um, it was 156 hours of fermentation. And then the distillation started, finished. So it's a very long distillation process, six days, which is very, very long for, for this. Uh, when it was filled, when the casks were married and when it was bottled. Um, and then terroir, you can zone right into the, into the farm to get all the details about it. Um, and what is, what is really fascinating, okay, so here's the soil. So you can see the breakdown of the soil. It tells you about it, a description, the elevation of it, uh, average sunlight, and all of the, uh, the variety of barley, the kind of yeast that was used, the uh, fermentation, I said 156 hours. Um, and Ned, Ned, who's the head distiller, his observations about this, um, you know, I like this multi raisins, orange chocolate, black peppercorns. Um, and then I mentioned the cast. So here it tells you exactly where this new make went into and where the distills came from. So the bourbon cast from Heaven Hill, uh, the Virgin American Oak, uh, some from the Speyside Cooperage and some from the Kelvin Cooperage and uh, the size of them, the premium French, the different forests that the premium French ones came from. And finally, the Vendu Naturale, and in this case, it was also sherry. So four sherry butts were filled. Um, there's the breakdown off it. And that's, in a nutshell, what gives you what's in your bottle. It's amazing how transparent they are hey, with everything that they do. For Absolutely, somebody who likes to nerd out on whiskey, yeah. that <laughs> is just amazing. You nerd out on data. 
<laughs> oh my yeah. god you know on the bottom I mean, of the bottle it says um you know if you can read it it's printed in there it says transparency traceability and terroir um so oh, that's, that's cool. you know forms the basis uh, of, of what waterford's all about and wow. everything that you're tasting has all of that in there that is that's phenomenal. I know what I'll be doing after the Zoom wraps up <laughs> because I'm going to totally geek out on some whiskey. Like that, that, that just really blew me away. I, I, I have to applaud, applaud Waterford on that because I'm really excited to get online now. <laughs> you know what, Chad, though? That's, that could backfire. Your wife says, what are you doing? He says, I'm listening to a field in Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, listening to, I'm listening to my whiskey grow. <laughs> uh, so she'll, just, she'll just shake her head and <laughs> got problems, boy. So we have. Uh, what's interesting is if you know uh, the Dunmore compared to the Rothcloth, um, you know you're getting some similarities, but you're also getting some differences. And don't forget, exactly the same barley, um, same sort of growing period. Um, the Dunmore had a slightly longer fermentation period, and that's just natural. I mean, you know, it depends how long. It's going to take the yeast to eat all the sugars in that barley and convert them to uh, alcohol. Um, and it was a sort of the same mix of barrels that it went into. And yet there is a distinct difference. There is a very big difference. The, uh, the, the second one, I'm getting a, a little bit bolder, a little it's bit bolder, spicy. more yeah, spicy, spicy, more, more, more up front. Raisins, uh, yeah, raisins kind of up front. Sort of like a fruit cake on the nose. Yeah, I'm getting a little. I don't know if anybody else is getting a little saltiness. Yeah, there's a little salinity that's in there. I think that's from the the limestone that's in the soil that contributes to it. Um, it's certainly you know the Dunmore is not anywhere near water that's going to influence uh, get, you know salt air that's going to come onto the barley, but certainly that peppery uh, spicy level is there. Um, there was a, a neat, you know, I've taken two sips out and I got in the same t twice. Uh, in the back third of your palate, uh, you just get this like quick little buildup of heat that it just kind of spreads out evenly over your tongue and just the sweetness envelops you. Mm. Uh, I, I kind of get the, the, the brininess, the saltiness in, in the palate as well. It's... I'm kind of really shocked, man. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't forget, this is, again, uh, just shy of four years old. Um, and, you know, it just goes to show you that age, uh, you know, if you saw this was a, you know, they'd have to call it three years because it's not four. So if they put an age statement out, it'd be three. Um, you know, how many people would buy it thinking, you know, it's a three-year-old whiskey? Right, so by not putting an age statement on it, and yet having the uh, the, the whole transparency when you go into the terroir code, um, you know, you try it first, and then you play around with the terroir code and try to find all that information out. And Chad, like you said, and Mindy as well, that this is, you know, if you're tasting this blind, there's no way you're going to say this is a, a three or four year old whiskey. Right, you're definitely not. So we have a question from Mark Pruitt, uh, Greg or Raj, either one of you can answer this. And Mark wants to know if you can tell us more about the cathedral, what it is and what does it do? Sure. Uh, so Greg, did you visit the cathedral when you were there? No, sadly we didn't have time, um, <clears throat> but I know about it, but I'm sure I don't know as much about it as you do. Um, so the cathedral, so uh, again, uh, you know, Waterford, uh, Mark and his team were looking to make sure that everything was kept separately. And so Minch Maltings is who does their maltings and sources their, and they had this uh, older building um, that was used to dry barley, but it had, so imagine you walk into a big barn that has different corrals where, you know, the, the different horses or cows are kept or whatever. Well, in this case, each of the corrals is dedicated to one farm's barley. So the barley comes in, it goes into that uh, division where it stay and allow it to dry until it's ready to malt. Uh, but the building is a very tall, high ceiling, 
uh, structure that looks like a cathedral and that's why it's been nicknamed the cathedral. So Mark, hopefully that answered your um, I know Mark, Mark uh, I know Mark and I know he likes to uh, get, uh, get technical on these things, so. <laughs> he likes to get a little geeky. One of his other questions, I think you've pretty much already ans answered, but I'll, I'll throw it out to you. Uh, terroir can be a complex subject. Can you provide a simple overview of what it is and why it's important to Waterford? I think you pretty well covered that already, but. Yeah, and it, you know, I think it's important to a lot of people. Uh, I was, yes, when I was on with, with Greg yesterday, we were talking about um, Westland Distillery and, and, you know, in Seattle um, and Matt Hoffman, who's the distiller there, is also focused on terroir, working with local farms to source the barley. Um, you know, Mark started doing that when he was at Brooklady, but um, you know, when the distillery was sold, he wasn't able to do exactly everything he wanted to. Um, but now he's able to go and and you know go to the next level in doing this. And uh, I'm just going to grab this book. Um, If you, if you haven't read this, I would uh, certainly say the Terroir of Whiskey by Rob Arnold. Uh, Rob, I'm uh, sorry, Rob Allison, who is, sorry, no, Rob Arnold. He's uh, a distiller in Texas and uh, he traveled around the, the world trying to analyze the Terroir of Whiskey and uh, it's, it's a great read to read about that. Okay, great. Looks like we lost Greg there for a minute. Uh, maybe <laughs> I'm, he's back. Yep. back. he's back. I was uh, you. I could hear you guys clear, but I lost. You all froze, and uh, but I could hear everyone. So I just because you're the only uh, one that froze for us, uh, right? <laughs> it was like musical yeah, chairs. Know. Everyone stop. But no. Nope. But I didn't miss a word. I didn't miss a word of it. And you know, um, the only thing I would say about the cathedral <clears throat> that uh, was interesting was because I know that Mark told us he was always frustrated at Brooklady that there wasn't the ability to isolate stuff to the extent he wanted to, you know, so this was sort of uh, a response to that. that Brooklady had no more room to do some of the things he wanted right. to do. And, and so uh, I feel like it's, you know, uh, we say it in the film, but it, there's so many things that Mark sort of, you know, put a, put a bookmark in until he could revisit them later. And now he's done it and he's done it like, you know, on a big, big scale. Yeah, even so, at the malting facility, it's dedicated. It only does maltings for Waterford. Uh, so there's no other distilleries barley that is being malted there. So there's no cr cross-contamination. Uh, even the trucks that are the lorries that bring the barley to the cathedral, uh, they're only used for transporting Waterford goods back and forth. So what's the process of drying their barley in the cathedral? The, uh, well, it's just, it's left, you know, it's in this left for a period of time. It, it is tossed to, you know, continue the drying process, uh, you know, because don't forget when you harvest barley, it is wet. And, right. uh, you know, ironically, you have to dry it and then wet it again to start, stop, start the germination. So but you can't do that until it's, until it's dry and uh, uh, able to, to do that. All right. Want to move on to uh, Dunbell? Sure, and we can do that. So uh, Dunbell, again, another US uh, exclusive. Um, this, there's only 6,000 bottles of it. So it's uh, the other, the first two were 13,000. And um, this is um, matured three years, eight months and 26 days. So a little less than both the Rathcloth and the Dunmore, but you're gonna taste how different this is. This um, is very heavy on the nose, very, it, so far this is my favorite one, the nose. Uh, beautiful, right. That's a nice a question. Yeah. These three are all single farm products. Right. How far apart are uh, single farm products? Uh, grains from different farms for each bottling. Um, what's the distance between the farms? Um, well, it varies, but the, actually the farms are all on sort of the same uh, soil strata. Okay. Um, so if you go in and look at them on the uh, uh, thing, but, you know, Ireland's not a, big, not a very big country. Um, no. So, you know, these, these farms are probably, you know, within 40 to 50 miles of each other. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe. So big enough difference. 
Yeah, but it, and it I'm sure if, you know, like this first one, I know it's right there on on, on the water, uh, versus these other two. I didn't see the map on them. I was right. just question just popped in my mind, and uh, yeah. because they're so distinctly different, yet eerily all the similar. Yeah, I mean, to date, Waterford has worked with about ninety different farms, um, but they've you know, they've sort of narrowed it down to about 40 farms that they have sort of either continued to work with or focused on, on 40 farms that they're, they're using. Um, so, you know, they're all pretty unique. This, uh, this Dunbell, this is actually uh, out of the three single farms. This is sort of my favorite. Um, had 141 hours of fermentation. And um, what's interesting, so the same similar mix, you know, 30, 33% into um, first fill bourbon casks, 22% into new or virgin American oak, 26% into French, and then 19% um, into the what they call the Vendu Natural, which are fortified wines. But in this case, you know, you're noticing a little different, something a little different on this, right? Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. So what do you what what do you equate it to? The, the first thing I, I popped in my mind was this is an easy single malt for a bourbon drinker. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm a bourbon guy through and through. I, I don't shame any whiskey. I like them all, but I'm definitely, my preference is bourbon. Uh, so right on the nose, I just got a lot going on and I'm still trying to decipher. Uh, and then I tried it and I was like, wow, that, that, that's that's special. Uh, so I'm really trying to. I got a lot going on over here right now. <laughs> I kind of go need a minute. This is uh, on the sorry, nose, no, go ahead. little green apple on the nose. One thing that strikes me on this one is that it's got a nice oily mouth feel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Adds to the cream on the nose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I can, you know which a, a all of them should have a, on it. Apricot. Okay. Yeah. yeah, all of them should have that nice, rich uh, mouthfeel because they're all, they're non-chill filtered. They're all at 100 proof or 50% alcohol, you know, all natural color, nothing added to it. So these are natural whiskeys, you know, um, but there is something, I don't know, if you dig into it, there is a little different aroma on the, this one than on the first two. This one to me so, is more minerally, nose and palate. Okay. And I'm definitely getting more spice in this one, almost like a, a rice, a heavier rye presence, mm -hmm. black pepper. Uh, this is a super, I'm, I'm kind of speechless, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm having a hard time deciphering this one because it has, it really has so much going on for such a simple whiskey, uh, a simple young whiskey. And yeah. Well, I would say like, you know, a couple of drops of water in there is going to change that. Um, it's going to help it open up a little bit more and help you pick up yeah, some of I those think, yeah. things you can't discern originally. Um, the, uh, I, you know, I never thought about it before tonight, Chad, but this is definitely as <clears throat> there's that kind of, there's a bourbon right up front in this that you can feel the very much, in the, the, I guess, comes from the casks, but has that kind of honey vanilla bourbon. And someone just yesterday asked me about whiskeys that were sort of good, that are bridges between bourbon into Irish whiskey or bourbon into Scotch whiskey, you know, and, and I listed a few I thought, but I didn't even think to this. I love this whiskey. Uh, I, I don't know which of these is my favorite, but I do know this is the one I've bought three bottles of. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I assume my wallet speaks louder than my palate. Yeah, this, so, this, one, this one's only available uh, online. It's not available through retailers. Um, so it is, uh, it's available through our website, uh, just a little plug there, but, uh, you know, it was a limited edition and, and, uh, Waterford, uh, said that this one, they wanted to make available just, uh, online, uh, to be able to reach. Raj, we do have a question order. about that. Yep. Uh, so since you're on the subject, uh, where can people in the U S get this, uh, how widespread is it yep. distributed over here in the U S uh, online retailers, so forth and whatnot. Uh, yeah, so if you go to our website, um, glassrev.com uh, and click on Waterford or where to buy, 
there's a whole list by states of uh, different retailers. So currently Waterford is in, a, I think about 35 states. Um, we're just about to enter a few more, including Hawaii. <laughs> It'll be in Hawaii uh, later uh, in June. Um, and uh, Ar uh, Arkansas, uh, Michigan, um, a few others that, and so we're continuing to add other states um, onto the list, but that's the most, uh, if you go onto our website and go to where to buy on Waterford, you'll be able to find that information about where it is available. And we try to keep that pretty current. So Mindy, I wanna hear a little bit more about your uh, opinion of this. Oh, they're not what I was expecting for sure. Um, the last two specifically remind me very much of Rise. Um, if you had blindfolded me and told me that this was an Irish whiskey, I probably would have argued with you. <laughs> um, this last one is phenomenal. It's got such an amazing depth of flavor um, that I wasn't expecting out of something so incredibly young. Um, but it's this one to me is um, more minerally than the second one that we tried. But the second one to me had more spice, but they're, mm. they've all been phenomenal. Well, I mean, what you know, I can't reiterate enough. What you're tasting is is predominantly the barley. Uh, you know, these are barley forward whiskeys, and and that's what you're getting. And um, you know, again, you you can't. I, I I have to sort of drive home the point is you you can't compare these to Irish whiskeys per se because mm -hmm. you know there's no green malt in it. They're all 100% malted barley. They're double distilled rather than triple distilled. So there's a lot of differentiators as to the way that Irish whiskey is, is normally made. But yeah, I, I think this is a great whiskey. I love this whiskey. This is definitely a uh, uh, sit in the easy chair kind of whiskey to drink. You, you know, kind of go in the other room, kind of forget about the day and just kind of sip on it. And being such, I, I'm kind of blown away thinking about that because being so young, I can compare this to some 18, 20 year old scotches, not that, I mean, you're really comparing apples and oranges, but the experience I want to have with this whiskey, that's where I'm at with it. I, I kind of want to go in, in, in the other room and chill. <laughs> well, it's all about exploration, right? I mean, I think uh, uh, Bill and Greg have mentioned the journey and this is, you know, enjoying these whiskeys is like a journey, right? You start... Yeah. Absolutely. From it, and you wonder, you know, where, how did it, how did it come to be? Uh, so then you go onto the website, you look at the terroir code, you listen to their farm, uh, you sort of uh, break it all down and, 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 and try to see, okay, does, is that telling me where this came from and what, how it came to be? Nice. Um, so they've progressively gotten better. Uh, and I haven't had a bad pour yet, but obviously this, I need a refill. <laughs> but that one's got a hole in it. Uh, yeah, uh, damn leaky glasses. What happens? So I'm, I, now I'm kind of anticipating and chomping at the bit for number four. And if you want to start talking about this blue topped one. Yeah, so uh, the, the first three we had were single farm origins. Uh, so dedicate, you know, specific single farms where all of the Ooh. barley came from. Uh, and how it was um, kept separate, you know, dried separate, malted separately, uh, mashed, fermented, distilled separately, and then uh, matured separately. Uh, the one we're going to move to now, which has the blue top, is the organic uh, Gaia. It's part of the Arcadian series. Um, so this is looking at um, how if you get a different kind of barley or different growing conditions, how it makes a difference. So in the Arcadian series later this year, we will have a biodynamic one. Um, and then probably next year we will have um, a heritage barley strain. Um, so this, because at that time there were not enough farms that were doing, they weren't producing enough organic barley. So this is actually from six different farms. Okay. And it has on the back uh, the different farmers' names that grew this organic barley. It's all the same kind of barley. It is, 
you know, a different barley strain than uh, the first three we had, which that was Irenia. Um, this is a, a, again, a different kind of barley. Um, and so this barley came from these six different farms. It was all stored together to dry together and then um, malted together, mashed, fermented, distilled together. So they didn't separate out the single farms. This is a accumulation of barley from six different farms. I have to say I cheated a little bit and uh, tasted these throughout the week. And this one stood out for me by far because even the nose is more complex. There, there's just a lot going on in the nose with this and I can't even put my finger on what it is, uh, but. Well, it's, you know, it's a very clean um, spirit. Uh, you know, a lot of, lot of true flavors uh, that are coming forward because again, there's not been no, you know, no form pesticides, no uh, inorganic material that has gone into this. This is all natural. Um, it's as natural as you're going to get until, until you get to try the biodynamic, which will be out later this year. Right. So is, Bill and I have talked about this whiskey all week. Uh, well, since he started sampling it and I told him I'm going to go at it blind. And he was describing to me with each one. And I see where he's going with this one. And he did rave about this one. Uh, this one to me has that kind of Highland single malt like well, there's about and, that much left and you probably can't <laughs> so I heard on I, I'll, I'll say one thing about all four of these pours uh they're all relatively young but not one of them drinks like a young whiskey uh yeah. this one I, i'm still about number this this guy right here i mean uh and i'm not taken away from anything. Bill loves this one. Uh, this one just has a lot going on. And I'm, once again, I'm a little bit beside, this is bold. This is kind of easy, like old smooth jazz. So you said the dumbbell was bold, but the organic is easy. Yes. yes. I'm sorry. I don't have the names written down. In yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't yeah. memorize them. So I apologize about that. Uh, I'm keeping track for you. So <laughs> one busy week for me in the last 24 hours has been crazy. Uh, yeah, uh, I but yep. uh, yeah, so the organic drinks like this 15, 18 year old, kind of like a yep. Highland scotch. Uh, it's a little darker than these. It's, it's got a lot going on too, man. Oh my God. Yeah, this, this is, this has been our, 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 probably our biggest seller we uh uh we're down to about our last 150 cases or so uh mm. and then but this was released around the world this was not a u.s exclusive yeah there was uh 24 000 bottles that uh were released around the world um we ended up getting i'm trying to remember uh three, about 18 uh 1800 bottles off it for the u.s okay um but it you know it is we're We've pretty much sold out. We've got a little bit left, and when that's gone, it's gone. But what you will have, I would, I would say, uh, hold on to, uh, like, you get a new bottle and hold on to it because in September we will have the organic 1.2. Okay. So it will be the same barley, uh, the same six farms, but the second release. Uh, and as as Mark Rainier likes to say, these one points are the youngest Waterfords you will ever have, right? Anything going forward is going to be older, right? Because okay. 1.2 will be older than 1.1. 1 .1. uh, any new releases will be older because they've been sitting there and maturing, you know, um, since they started distilling. So it would be interesting to compare the 1.1 1 .1 to the 1.2 and see how that has evolved and how that that barley has continued to develop and the flavors have to continue to develop. Mm. Mindy, you know, um, your opinion? It's definitely lighter and fruitier than the rest of them to me, at least. It's very melon mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. It's super mellow. And the finish is super long in this. I mean, in incredibly long, but it's not... Here I am. Pay attention. 
it, it's just kind of kind of hanging, chilling. Hey, what's going on, guys? You know, this, <laughs> that, and the other. And it, it's a fun drink. It, it I, I'm really kind of blown away by all, all four expressions. Uh, the latter two, especially. Uh, number three, personally. Uh, but yeah, it's just so much going on for such a young whiskey. I mean, I, I, I'm just going to raise a glass to water and say, <laughs> well, freaking done. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, to me, this is a whiskey you want to just sort of savor and contemplate life, uh, you know, compare yes. life to the way things are. Um, you know, just goes to show you a, a natural, organic life is going to give you so much. Wow. You know, um, there's a, in case people haven't seen our film yet, um, and, if, and if you do see the film, <clears throat> I'm going to ruin something, but it's a very, very minor thing. If you watch it all through the closing credits at the very end, there's a little button at the end. Uh, and actually, I'm not going to ruin it. That's only part of it. The part I'm going to talk about is the other part. There's a line that we don't use in there because it didn't make sense out of context, but it's what we're talking about right now. It's Mark Renier talking to Jim McEwen, and he's talking mm -hmm. about the, the single farms versus a, like a, a, a cuvee like this. And what he said, it was really interesting. He said, the single farm is, is God's whiskey. It's what God gives us. The, this field, this is what God grew in this field for this year and what we were able to do with what God gave us. But this is us playing God. This is us saying, okay, well, I'll take some of this and some of this and I'll mix these together and I'll make my own thing. And then that's the, you know, and in, in our clip, he says, Jim is our God, but he's talking about the Bricklotti days, but still mm, Ned yeah. is the God now. <laughs> Ned is the yeah. God of Bricklotti. But I love the, I love the, the, the poetry of that, you know, the, the sort of yeah. musicality of bringing these instruments together. And that's a good point, Greg, because these, these single farms um, are stepping stones to where Waterford's going. So the, the cuvee that's going to get released this year is going to be a marriage of 25 to 30 farms. The, the whiskeys from there, they were all aged separately and they've been married together to create, um, as, as Mark likes to say, one mind fuck of a whiskey. Um, <laughs> and that's where they're going, is, is trying oh, to boy. show you that these are the components, <laughs> but where you want to get to is this next step, um, you know, and he equates it to, if you look at the top wines from France, so you look at Bordeaux or Burgundy and it says Grand Vin on it, that is not a single wine, it is the, the Grand, the big wine. So, the, you know, when the, when the winemakers, they grow their grapes, uh, they harvest them, they're all kept separate. So, you know, Bordeaux is made up of up to five different grape varietals. So they're kept, matured separately, and then they're blended together to create the wine that's gonna be released. And it's the same thing here, that it's going to end up being something that is gonna be even bigger. All right. Can't wait. So, uh, yeah. We've got a couple of questions from our members, but uh, I wanna get into uh, our, our our format here and have Mindy uh, go into the next question now that we've gone through the four iter iterations of Waterford. So we briefly touched on this already, but the founder and CEO of Waterford, Mark Renier, has been in the industry for 40 plus years and has a connection to another major distillery that's also featured in the Water of Life film. Can Raj or Greg elaborate on that connection a little bit more for us? I'll let Greg, I'll let Greg take that one because <laughs> he alluded to it before. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, um, it, it's a little challenging to do it without giving out too many spoilers, but uh, you know, Mark, Mark, uh, Mark had a unique vision. Mark has a moment in his life in 1985, according to him, which you'd see in our film, and it changed his life forever. And I think that inspired him to change the whiskey world forever. And I think he has continued doing that no matter where he's been, whether it was at Brooklady, and you can have to see the film if you haven't yet to, to, to learn that part of the story. But then now he's taken his vision to uh, um, another team, you know, and uh, it's uh, like so many, uh, it's, it, it, this is a, it's a very different experiment, but it's the same experiment. It just has 
well, it has a bank account behind it now, for one thing. <laughs> I, you know, it's not, it's not how do we make great whiskey and keep the lights on. Now it's, you know, he's, he's got the lights thing worked out. So it's, you know, the, um, he gets to uh, play the guy. I think that the craftsmanship is the same. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. So something I picked up from the film, The Water of Life, the Brook Lottie, the story was sold to Remy back in 2012. Um, the, the, they bought the former Guinness Brewery in Waterford in 2014, transforming it into the state-of-the-art distiller, uh, state-of-the-art brewery into a modern distillery. What was his uh, vision for the next big step on that? Well, Mark, you know, so when Mark was at Brook um, he asked uh, Duncan, who was the head distiller there, where the best barley came from, and, and, and Duncan said Ireland. Um, so he wanted to follow the barley. And uh, he looked, he actually looked around Scotland, looked around England, uh, trying to decide where to build the distillery. And in Ireland, he happened to come across this, um, you know, state-of-the-art brewery that Guinness uh, but then had decided to abandon to, to uh, focus all of their production at St. James's Gate in Dublin. Um, so the fact that it was up for sale was great because it had not only all the old brewery equipment, uh, the natural aquifer, great location right on the river, um, but it also had enough space to build a distillery. And uh, that's what they, they ended up doing was building it right there on the site. Um, and lots of lots of toys and other things to play with uh, and to to uh, to make to, you know to allow them to have their vision. Great. So Greg, would you tell our viewers about your film and how they can obtain access to view the water of life? Yeah, absolutely. I, I will put a link in the chat for people that want to see it. We're, we're, we're doing screenings online um, and we have them gone going currently partnered with the WBSE and Alphonse will put something in the chat or we can share it. Somewhere. I've got a graphic here if you want to, if you want to, um, if you want to sure. see that. I mean, you could talk over it, Greg. I'll just show this. Absolutely. To the audience. Yeah. So, um, what, you know, this, this would have been the time when our film would have been trying to go to film festivals and whiskey festivals and theaters and, and, so what we're doing now is we decided we got tired of waiting like during the pandemic we were supposed to premiere a year ago yesterday and we had to wait so back in january we started getting creative and sharing it online and sharing it with the whiskey world and you know we love whiskey and the guys here like chad and bill and the team they love whiskey and so it's a really good fit for us to sort of say let's let's share these stories with these whiskey makers and then share the film at the same time so i assume people watching a lot of you will have seen the film and and that's awesome and thank you so much. But uh, there's a link that should be, or uh, that was just showing over the screen there for a minute um, as well, that will take you right to our page, which is wateroflifefilm.com slash partners slash WBSE. But that'll be open whenever you want and you can go see the film. And then we're gonna be doing these once a month and all of these are themed with different distillers and distilleries and bottlers and things that are featured in the film. So, you know, that's if people haven't seen it yet, I would encourage you to do so and I would love you to do so. And then. If you can drink some of these great whiskeys along with the film. Yeah, and that link is actually uh, pinned to the top of our WBSC page in the announcement section. So you oh, can awesome. sit there and click on it. Yeah, if I put it in the chat here, it doesn't go out to the world. All right. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. There's a there's another <laughs> layer of chatness above us. <laughs> <laughs> the greater People good. Get my chat out there. <laughs> hey, Mindy. Yeah, it really is a great film, and if y'all haven't, you know, seen it already, I highly suggest that you grab a ticket to it. Um, and like Bill said, it is pinned in the group. Um, but getting back to Waterford, mm. Raj, in your opinion, and I think I already know your answer to this, but what do you think makes Waterford whiskey so unique? Well, I, 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 I think it's I, I, the traceability. It's the focus on, focus on, sorry, I got an echo. Uh, it's a focus on, uh, it's a focus on, barley. on uh, Barley. Where it's coming from, the the single the Irish barley. The, the um, you know, Irish barley. Mark will have you say um, you know, that if you're, making, that um, if you're making um, Irish whiskey, why are you not using Irish barley? And so in this case, they're using Irish barley. The traceability of it, uh, the focus on uh, the dedication to making these whiskeys, um, the law, the short cuts that they're taking, the long fermentation periods. 
um, the high quality casks that they're using to mature the whiskey in, you know, they've spent to date about $7 million in barrels, you know, which is a lot of money. And it, you know, if you go, if you put in the terroir code, it tells you exactly where those barrels came from. So there's full traceability and transparency on there. Um, and I think it's, it's just a, a real dedication to creating, um, an excellent whiskey. Nice. So, uh, terroir, terroir, um, it's a very popular term being used in whiskey today. Um, where can you describe, uh, Waterford's approach to it? Um, sure. Uh, you know, so if you look at, if you look at Scotland, 60% of the barley that's used there comes from abroad. It comes from the Middle East, it comes from the Ukraine, it comes from Canada. Um, most of the times the distillers don't even know or really care. And I'm, just saying, I'm not lumping everyone together, but uh, really care about where that barley comes from or what varietal it is, or you know, they just want the best yield they can get from it. And here um, in Waterford, uh, Mark wanted to talk about the barley and this, the, the, the terroir, the, the growing conditions, the soil conditions, the um, climate that goes into creating that barley. And so you can taste the difference. And part of it is they partnered with the University of Oregon um, and uh, the Irish Agricultural Council um, to study that and they've taken all of the you know here, the new makes and drop them into the to be analyzed and look at what the flavor profiles are so they've laid you know there's a paper that was recently published that showed that all of these different farms the barley comes from it have all different flavor profiles and some of them have two to three hundred different flavors that you know, the average person can't even taste. Um, but it just goes to show you the complexity of the barley and what it contributes and can contribute to the whiskey. So Raj, we have another question from one of our members uh, and that is, how did you get involved in whiskey? Well, it was a dark and stormy night, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it was, uh, uh, that's a good point. I mean, it, you know, growing up, um, uh, I grew up in, 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 in Toronto, in Canada, and, uh, you know, uh, back in the 70s, um, my dad always had uh, Johnny Walker Black and um, one other whiskey at home. And that's, you know, back in the, uh, until the 80s, there wasn't really a lot of single malts that were out there. Uh, and it wasn't until I went to Europe um, after university that I first started drinking single malts. Uh, and back then, Glenfiddich was, you know, the the most readily available, um, but it, you know, so I've educated myself through it. And then it wasn't until, oh, 2008 or nine that my, uh, my business partners who were in Canada called me and said, uh, we have this uh, whiskey from India, um, Amrut, and they're looking to go into the US. Um, so I wasn't doing it at the time and I decided, yeah, I'll give it a shot, you know, um, and, 10, you know, 11 years later, 12 years later, um, we, we've continued to grow and add great brands like Waterford to our portfolio. Um, and, you know, I've continued to learn about it and teach about it. Uh, you know, not only am I a whiskey ambassador, but I'm also a WSCT, which is the Wine and Spirits Education Trust um, educator, spirits educator. So I teach level one and two, and soon I'll be teaching level three uh, in there. Nice. Okay, Mindy. <clears throat> said Waterford, for all intents and purposes, is a scotch. You know, on the label, it says Irish whiskey. Why is this? Well, because it's made in Ireland. <laughs> so they can call it scotch. You know, it's, it's uh, I mean, I mentioned Indy before. I get people going, I love that Indian scotch. Well, I go, well, it's not, you know, it's not a scotch. It's, it's an Indian <laughs> single malt. Um, but you're right. For all intents and purposes, it is a Scot. If it was made in Scotland, it would be a Scottish single malt. But 
It is made in Ireland. Uh, it is probably more Irish because it's Irish barley, um, but they follow the you know SWA Scottish Whiskey Association regulations about how they're making it. All right, Greg, you're on the spot now. All right. How and why did you decide to include Waterford Distillery in your film? Well, you know, um, when we first started talking about making a film, we, Alphonse can tell you this, we talked about making a film about whiskey. And, and, and that term was so loosely defined when we started talking about it that we had conversations about whether we were going to spell the project's name within the year without because we were just going to tell a story about whiskey and then it quickly became apparent to us that that was not one film that was like a ken burns like eight week <laughs> that was we've got to go to kentucky and we've got to go to india and canada and australia and you know that was a, that's a different film so we were like all right we're going to narrow our scope we're going to focus on scotch and then we'll go from there and we want to do we i will say this this i think we may have completely lost them that time uh, uh, Franz, would you like we, to take really over for great stories about whiskey all around the world wait and we have some and not just whiskey Very uh, uh, my back might be back kind of um oh, man sort of <laughs> uh, you're frozen, but keep telling the story. <laughs> keep talking. The face is beautiful. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, man, I was in flow, you know. Uh, so what we wanted to do is tell a story about, about scotch. And we wanted to tell the story that focused on the craft side of scotch. And one of the things that became apparent very quickly was body. and so we were like we're going to zoom in on that story i don't know i'm so sorry about this guys i don't know what's wrong with my internet i have no idea okay. um but well we could hear you but now we can't hear you yep now it's completely gone All right, Bons, do you have a clip you want to show in there yeah, I could do. I could do that. I could vamp a little bit here and da 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 da. da. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know yeah, we have a we have a little we have a clip that's basically uh, tells you what you know. I mean, whiskey's good for anything, right? right. So uh, it's good for the soul. Hey, well, that too. Let me uh, let me let me switch this over here. Wait, Greg's on his way back. Maybe, maybe not. All right, I'm going to share this and then. Uh, yeah, he's trying. He's a robot. Yeah, we just got to cut him <laughs> off there. <laughs> right. Tasha, kill him. All right. Sorry, Greg. <laughs> oh, wait, stop. I'm sharing the same screen here. Oh, uh -oh now we lost the recording. There we go. Hmm. Let me get that over here. Now that's you. Uh -huh. Gotta love when we have little technical issues. Mm -hmm. Kind of comic, almost com pure comic relief. That's all right. We can drink whiskey while we're waiting. There we go. Yeah, there we go. You can celebrate with a whiskey. You can ha go to a funeral and have a whiskey. You can have a birthday and have a whiskey. You can have a whiskey on a Tuesday. Whiskey's for any time and it's not just for your dad. This is uncorking entertainment. This is uncorking conviviality and fun and smiles and laughter, whatever you want to call it. I've never once met anyone who goes, I neck a glass of whiskey or whatever, and they sit there and there's no emotion behind it. If you do that, God, go and drink vodka. <laughs> great clip great clip. beautiful beautiful great. beautiful <laughs> when in doubt back. drink it out drink it out baby <laughs> so that that brings me on, on behalf of myself bill and mindy 
and all of WBSC. We'd like to thank Raj, Greg, who has been in and out of here tonight, and Alphonse, the Fonz, uh, for sharing their evening with us uh, and the fantastic whiskey of Waterford. Um, wow, well, what a great tasting this has been. And thanks for sharing the clips of Waterford, uh, Waterford Water of Life, the film of whiskey. Uh, if you haven't seen it, click the link, go watch the movie. Uh, there's a lot of great whiskey movies out there. Uh, we all know one that we particularly love. It's pretty neat. Uh, this one is right on the same page. Get out there and watch that movie, seriously. Uh, so remember, remember everybody, crack a bottle. <laughs> Let's share a pour, man. Cheers. He's going for this number three. Cheers, Slancha. Thanks, everyone.